Hey everyone, Tom Lisa Mann from Calvary Baptist Church and Heavy Deep World Ministries. It's great to see everybody on this nice uh, Sunday, the uh, third Sunday of the month. We're here this, this week and next week. Um, as always, we open a prayer and I just get right into it and see what God's got for us. So let's just pray real quick. Father, thanks for the uh, time today to just get into your word a little bit and uh, praise you. because That's what it's all about, is worshiping you, Lord. We thank you for these incredible women that... Uh, your hands on them, that you are guiding and moving them, that you're transforming them, and that uh, somehow tonight you have something for them. I don't know what it's going to be, Lord, but whatever it is, may the Holy Spirit move powerfully through what we're doing tonight, and just uh, guide us and teach us and reveal to us what your word has to say. We thank you, Lord, again for being able to come to this wonderful place and do what we do. Praise in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right, I'm going to be in Genesis chapter 3. I'm going to read verses 1 through 5, and uh, I'm going to talk about being like God, being like God. So let me just read this to you real quick, and, uh, and then and we'll get started. So chapter 3 starts, it says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Hmm. So the women saw that the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise. Ooh, bad. She took of the fruit and ate. She also gave it to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. So it's really interesting when you read this, especially when you read some of the Hebrew words that are here. It says a couple things that are, that are a little bit different. When it says that you won't die, your eyes will be open, you'll be like God. What it really says in the Hebrew is you'll be like the gods. Like the gods. Because a little later in verse 22, God's talking amongst the heavenly host. And he says that, uh, um, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. Now lest he put his hand on the tree of life, we're kicking him out of the garden. Get the cherubs. Get the little swords of fire. Make sure they can't come back in. Um, so what we know is that there's a knowledge of what good and evil is amongst the heavenly hosts that man was not supposed to know. And so when you're reading this, you go, wait, wait a minute. Didn't they already know it was good and evil? God told them, trees in the garden, good. Don't eat that one, bad. They know right and wrong. And it's really interesting because that, that's true. They did. They, they knew right and wrong. God had told them what right and wrong was. But when you read the commentaries, what's, what's fascinating about this, and this is where we're going to get to, the idea of eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil had a different definition than just knowing what was right and what was wrong. So I want to read you something from uh, the Jerusalem Bible, of all things, from 1966, because we're going to go back a little ways. It says this, The knowledge of, is a privilege that which God reserves to himself. By sinning and laying hands on it, it doesn't mean that man's omniscient. He's not God. However, it does mean that it is in the power of man to decide for himself what is good and what is evil. So before they got to this tree, before serpent, the serpent tempted them, God was telling them, this is good, this is bad. You know, do what I say, you'll, things will go well for you. It's great. What the serpent said was, oh, no, 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 you got to be like God. You'll be wise. You'll be smart. You'll just be like God. Now, from a perspective, you think of Adam and Eve. Wouldn't you want to be like God? Wouldn't you want to be smart and wise? Of course you would. Yeah, that means God. Be great. I want to be like God. But they didn't obey. What they did was they listened to the serpent and said, oh, this will be great. We'll be like him. But what they learned was now they, in their own humanness, have stolen the prerogative from God of discerning what is good and what is evil. Oh. Instead of allowing God to tell them what was good and oh, what was evil. Okay. And that's the beginning of the whole crash of the system. Mm 
right? We got the fall of mankind. We got the fall of creation. They're kicked out of the garden. Man has to work and all this stuff. And here we are today at Smokka. <laughs> That's a short history of the world, by the way. Um, <laughs> and what's fascinating about this, in my mind, is when you look at this ability to decide between right and wrong in our own humanness, it's a very limited look, isn't it? Yes. I'm reading a book right now uh, on, on uh, spiritual warfare, demonology. Uh, I like a little light bedtime reading. And uh, uh, this guy makes this great point. He says, uh, uh, he says, well, we're working things out here on Earth. There's a whole spirit world yep. that is very connected to us that we don't see. And he uses an example in Daniel. Daniel's praying, and God sends a messenger angel to come give Daniel the answer. But the messenger angel gets stopped by a demon angel called the Prince of Persia. And the messenger angel has to call Michael, the archangel, to come take care of this guy so he can go deliver the message. Well, that's, nobody knows that. So poor Daniel's sitting there praying to God, and he's not getting an answer. He has no idea this battle is taking place between the messenger angel, the archangel, and the demon angel so that the messenger angel can come deliver the message. So I would tell you, maybe you've made a prayer and you're like, God didn't answer it. What do you think is happening in the spirit world right now? Lots There's of probably a messenger angel trying to get to you that Satan doesn't want to get to you. That's right. Right? So there's all this stuff happening that we don't see, and we really don't think about it, to be honest with you. We just really don't think about it. But this is so important because what it's saying is we now are choosing to be morally independent of God because I can decide what's right and wrong. I don't need God anymore. So we refuse to recognize God as creator and us as created. We're now like God. We're our own gods. And so um, it's really fascinating to me because when we look at that, that whole story, we run into three major sins. Pride of life, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh. Pride, I want to be like God. <coughs> lust of the eyes, fruit look pretty good. Lust of the flesh, I'm hungry. I want to eat the dumb thing. Okay? And Every sin that we do, everything that rebels against God, our selfishness, it's all selfishness, mm -hmm. is one of those three. They all fall into that category. Which is what, why when Jesus was tempted in the garden, he was tempted with pride of life, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes. The first one was lust of the flesh. You haven't eaten in 40 days and nights. Make these stones into the bread and you can eat. Man does not live by bread alone. <laughs> okay? That was lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes. See all these kingdoms? They'll be yours if you bow down to me. Mm -hmm. All that could have been his. It was already his. He didn't need that. And then the lust of the uh, uh, pride of life was, you are, you know, you're supposedly the son of God. If you fall down from the top of the temple, your angels will you know, prove to you that you're, you're somebody. So all three things that Adam and Eve failed, Jesus redeems in his temptation yeah. in the desert. And why this is important is we in our humanness, and our fallenness, still do pride of life, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes. It's, it's just our condition. It's our condition. So I want to go through these, and I want to talk about what Jesus did and why Jesus said some of the things he said that reconciles us in some of these ways. So anything that is self-focused and glorifying ourselves instead of God is pride. Right? And so... I get people say, that say, yeah, you should be proud of the job you did. Oh, I don't want to be proud of it. Like, oh my gosh, that's not what he's talking about. <laughs> be proud of the job you did. It is, though, saying, um, look at me. Or uh, I'm so focused on my job title, my promotions, my whatever, that I have to have these things. The, the, or even if you say my identity. What's your identity? I'm a mom. I thought you were a daughter of the most high. That's right. So sometimes you get, even in things that seem good, you get prideful, you get this pride of life thing. Because you're aggrandizing it above God. And it's, it's all, and it's normal, it's natural. Every one of us do it, I do it. I did it for years. And it's hard, um, it's, it's such a slippery slope because Satan's trying to tell you, you should be proud of the job you do, you should be proud of your title, you should be proud of your money, you should be proud of your house, you should be proud, you should be proud. And it gets to the place where you're like, you bet, I should be proud, I deserve this. And that's the slippery slope, and they all fall down, and, and you know, you meet Jesus, and it doesn't go well. Lust of the eyes, things we want and believe that, um, and we believe that we should get, because the ends justify the means. The ends justify the means. 
And that's a bad one. What that means is, I think this is so important, it doesn't matter how I get it, as long as I get it. So if I have to hurt people's feelings along the way, eh, say love you. If um, it hurts me along the way, eh, oh well. If, <coughs> if, if I have to do something illegal to get it, eh, okay. It, it, this is more important, right? And you'll see that in politics. I used to work in politics. They'll do anything, lie, cheat, steal, to get what they want. You just watch what happened to Obama and the, or with uh, Biden. Obama and all the, all the people that were on the inner circle of the elites got to not run again. Because the end justifies the means for that. And this is just a normal thing we do. And the lust of the eyes is anything we want, and, and uh, or the lust of the flesh, excuse me, that's what's the last. Lust of the flesh is physical desires, no matter how damaging to us. If you ever had an addiction issue, you know that your physical desires sometimes override your frontal lobe, and your brain's telling you no, but your body's saying, gimme, 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 gimme. Right? And your body overrides it because the lust of the flesh is too great. And even though it'll damage you, uh, you gotta have it. I have a sister um, who, who drinks too much, um, seriously drinks too much. And she's also got lung cancer. Smoked for 50 years. So the doctor, of course, tells her, stop smoking, stop drinking. Not gonna do it. But she just will not do it. Now, I love her to death, but it, that's how it's gonna be. And there's no change in her mind because those things are more important to her than anything else. And that's lust of the flesh. Those things become more important to you than anything else. And you will, you will risk everything for lust of the flesh. Right? And that's why it's so dangerous. Because when you get fight of life, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, these, these two big sin areas, um, it's not, you know, I, I, the word sin, I get it, but it's all selfishness. It's all choosing us over God. Now, when we agree that God is a creator and he made us, I can then agree logically that he would know what's best for me. Right? He wouldn't make me and then just tell me, hey, Tom, go play with a ball in the street. <laughs> no, he might with me, but um, he's going to do what's best for me. So he, he writes this book, and in this book, I guarantee you there's something in it that every one of us will disagree with. There's something in here where we're like, ah, really? And then we start to become our own gods and say, he couldn't be seriously about that. Or that was cultural. Or I just disagree with that. I'm not going to go that way. And that's where we end up getting this spiritual warfare. The spirit world starts acting on us. I had this guy that I've been working with for months. Um, he believed that God hates him. And that God should have intervened in his life multiple times and kept him from whatever harm he's had. And that because God didn't, God is evil. And he just wrote me that he's decided to give up on God, which kind of cracks me up because he's still admitting that God is God. Um, and I wrote him a couple weeks later and said, how's it going being, you know, being out, outside of the faith? He goes, it's going great. I've never been happier. I've not been depressed. I've not been this and that. And I said, that doesn't surprise me. He goes, why? I said, because Satan's already got you. You get everything of this world. But when you meet Jesus, it's going to be a whole different story. He goes, well, I get the spiritual warfare piece. <laughs> I'm like, this poor guy. Because in his own definition of what is good and what is evil, he's calling God evil because he's not getting what he thinks he deserves or wants from God. It's hard to talk to those folks, right? It's hard to, it's hard to turn them around. That's a Holy Spirit thing where you got to pray about it and have the Holy Spirit do his work. Um, but I don't give him too much of a hard time, honestly. I, I still talk with him and love the guy because what, aren't we all like that? Yeah. Isn't there some area in our life we all do that? Yeah. This guy's just the, the kind of the example of the pendulum swung so far out that he's just like that. But I think that any of us in here it, that would say that I'm totally surrendered to God, totally, you're not being honest. There's always something, there's that, always that thorn in that side that every single one of us has where we're not quite there yet. Because if we were totally surrendered to God, We'd all be Jesus. <laughs> and we'd all need a savior because we're not that. Right? And so one of the things that happens is um, we read this book, and Jesus comes. And this was in this Eve Allison book, too. It said things were different in the Old Testament because Jesus hadn't come to reclaim earth. So Satan is the prince of this world. 
of course, Scripture says. <coughs> Jesus comes, and all of a sudden, there's all sorts of demonic activity. There's all sorts of demonic uh, uh, indwelling. There's all sorts of possessions, all this stuff. Jesus is doing exorcisms all over the place. And you're like, what happened between the Old Testament and New Testament? Well, Jesus, the devil didn't need to do any of that stuff in the Old Testament. Jesus hadn't come to reclaim it yet. That's right. He hadn't come to reconcile it yet. As soon as Jesus hit the stage, that blew up. Right? And so Jesus comes in, what does he say? Well, first thing he starts with is these things called the great reversals. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. That's right. Judge not. Um, turn the other cheek. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, bear with each other. And people are like, what are you talking about, you lunatic? We don't do that. That's not the way of the world. And it, theologically, we call them the great reversals because mm -hmm. Jesus was teaching us God's kingdom works exact opposite of Satan's kingdom. And so you do things that are not like Satan, not like the world. But then he said something really interesting. He said, you have to have faith, a childlike faith. You have to die to yourself and pick up your cross and carry it daily. Now, let's reframe this. We know that the fall was because they wanted to be like gods. They wanted to decide for themselves what was good and what was evil. And we've been doing that ever since. Jesus comes and says, no, no, you got to have childlike faith. You gotta die to yourself. Don't, don't, no, you don't do that. God is God. He says at one point, Why do you say you love me if you don't do what I command? If you love me, you'll do what I say. And what he's doing is reversing the fall. He's already beaten the temptations to reconcile that part where Adam and Eve were tempted by lust, pride of life, lust of flesh, lust of the eyes. Now he's turning it because he's, he's beat, beaten that in the desert <coughs> temptation. Now he's saying, look, you all aren't gods. <laughs> this isn't your job to decide what's right and wrong. It's God's job to find, to find what's right and wrong. So there's a scene where his, his brother and his mom come to this little place, restaurant or whatever it was, to come get him. And they say, hey, Jesus, your mom and brother's there. And they think he's, he, they think he's that crap crazy. They're coming to get him because he's, he's talking about all this Messiah stuff. And he looks at the crowd and says, who's my mother? Who's my brother? Only those who do the will of the Lord. Only those who do the will of the Lord. And he keeps on saying things like this, but the purpose of saying it is, hey, guess what? You're not your own gods. God, the Father, makes the rules as to what is good and what is evil. And when you have a childlike faith and you die to yourself, you no longer want to make those decisions. You want to follow what God says. And this is the transformation that takes place where Scripture says when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you become a new creation in Christ. The old is gone, the new has come. Well, what is the old? The old is the one that is their own gods. The new is the one that's going to say, I'm going to do my best to surrender this. Now, in our flesh, we cannot do it perfectly. Every one of us fails. I fail God every day. But here's the good news. We call it the good news. The good news is I'm not being judged on my performance anymore. I've surrendered. I've told God, hey, I want to do it your way. I'm not a God. I don't want to make these decisions about what's good and evil. I may not agree with everything, but I'm going to follow your word the best I can. Uh, I'm going to repent when I fall. But I understand that I'm saved by grace through my faith. And God is judging me on is am I faithful to my commitment to him? Not, am I checking every box and following every rule? Because he knows in my fallen state, I can't do it. I can't do it. But the problem we have, and I see this in the church, I see it everywhere I go. Uh, and I'm sympathetic to it because I used to live like this too. Our desire for self-gratification, self-satisfaction, our self, what we consider our needs and wants, are so strong. And then Satan comes and just fans them. And you have a hard time dying to yourself. Right? Um, one of the things I tell people is you don't get to act on every impulse you have. But don't we? We shouldn't. But we do a lot. We act on it very impulsively. And, and God tells us in this book, it's not good for you. You're going to reap what you sow. So don't do it. It's going it's to be harmful. Right? And it may not be harmful to you, but it may be harmful to somebody else. Because the collateral damage that you cause by 
doing that. And so when I read this book, you get to places like Leviticus. Everyone hates the book of Leviticus. I'm like, it's a great book. Leviticus is the health and welfare book. It tells you how not to eat like raw um, shellfish. Great. <laughs> I think, this, I think in Leviticus 5 it says, don't buy warm shellfish from the white van by the coast. <laughs> you see those vans out there? It's like, is anybody buying that stuff? It's crazy. Um, everything in this book is great for teaching us and trying to tell us that God loves us so much that he wants us to live a certain way that is best for us, that will give us the best life we can have. Because Jesus said, I want you to have life, I want you to have it abundantly. The very first thing Jesus said was, in order to be a follower of Christ, you need to admit you're a sinner. Right? That's, that's the very first thing. It's like, it's like every 12-step program. You've got to admit you've got a problem. Well, we admit we are a sinner, but what are we admitting to? We're admitting that I like to be my own God. I'm admitting I like to do things my way, not God's way. I like to admit that there's part of this Bible I like and part of it I don't. I have to admit that part of this Bible I follow and part of it I don't. There's this great line by some one of the ancients that said, uh, uh, if you believe the things you like and throw out the things you don't like about the Gospels, you're not worshiping Jesus, you're worshiping yourself. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah, I know, that guy's pretty smart, wasn't he? I stole him. Yes, you way in the back. Carry on. Can you repeat that, what you said, though? Yeah, I said that if you take things that you like in the Bible and throw out the things you don't like, you're not worshiping Jesus, you're worshiping yourself. Because all you're worshiping is the things you like. Huh. Right? And so Jesus challenged us. He tells this parable, he says, that was basically count the cost. He talks about building a building, and if you don't make sure you have enough money, people are going to make fun of you because you never finished the building. And he says, count the cost. And then his disciples had no idea what he was saying. He says, what I mean is, if you're going to follow me, there's a price. Mm -hmm. Everyone thinks being a Christian is like gravy. It's the hardest walk there is to walk. We are in a very, very dark world. The world we're saving is the prince of the world. We are the light shining in the darkness. People should see you walk into Walmart and go, ooh, there's one of those Christians. Right? That's true. We are supposed to exude this thing because we're not about ourselves. It's not about us being our own gods. It is about loving people that are unlovable because God loved me when I was unlovable. It's about being the things Jesus showed us to be, compassionate, truthful. Because the biggest thing you can do to love someone is tell the truth. Right? We're supposed to be all those things. But we don't. We're embarrassed. We don't go off like one of our way. We don't we 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 want to blend in. I mean, who wants to get pointed at as being one of them? Right? It's funny, at least I do weddings, I do weddings and Sometimes they want us to stay afterwards. <laughs> we sit at the table <laughs> and no one sits with us. <laughs> it cracks me up. I'm a really nice guy. But because I'm the pastor guy that did the wedding, they're afraid that I'm going to like preach at them uh, as if that's the only conversation I know how to have. Uh, and no one ever comes talk to us because they don't really want to have that dynamic. The body of Christ should be eager to see each other do the secret handshake get together and talk, right? That's what we should be excited about that. We should be going, oh, man. Because all, we're all we got. That's right. We're all we got. And the spiritual thing that's happening that we don't see is working overtime to keep you from having the abundant life God wants you to have. Either by closing doors, convincing you you're not worthy, having you be tempted in a place where you, you self-sabotage yourself, all that stuff plays out. And it's all because of this original thing that happened where man decided, I want to be like the gods. I want to know for myself what is good and evil. I want to decide. I want to be the one. And there are some real hot button issues, aren't there, in the Bible? Real cultural hot button issues where if you stick with this, people are not going to be happy with you. And I ask you this question. Would you rather be having to explain to Jesus, because you're all going to meet him, right? You know that, right? You're going to have a meeting with Jesus. And Jesus said, ah, come into my house. <laughs> Would you rather explain to him why you believe this or why you didn't believe this? Think about that. Right? I'd rather explain why I believe this. 
I think I got a better shot to make that argument than to say, well, you know, Jesus, really? You walk on water? Come on. And we're very kids You know, there's, yeah. <laughs> there, there's so much we don't think about about the eternity that we are going to live in because we're really focused on the here and now. Uh, my wife is a great example of she, whatever's right in front of her is what's in front of her. Right? And we're always having to think about, hey, look, understand what we're doing is within this big scope of the spiritual world and our eternity. What do you, that, scripture says every word out of your mouth is going to be judged. I am indeed Kenshi. Right? <laughs> because, yeah, I've said horrible things and, and think horrible things. I'm, and my blessings are going to be limited <laughs> in certain areas because I'm stupid. I'm forgiven. My salvation is not in danger, but I'm stupid. A lot of people out there want to be gods of their own lives in certain ways. So my challenge to you is this. Think about your life. What's the thorn in your side? Where's the place you're saying, I don't want to follow God's word on this, I'm going to follow my own? And be honest with yourself. You know, scripture says, have a sober judgment. It means, you know, be, just be honest. Scripture also says, come let us reason together. God understands your, your thinking and your pain and, and your reasoning. He doesn't expect you to leave your brain at the door. Talk to him. So when I'm having my issues, I, 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 man, I wrestle with God all the time about it. Because I want to be Christ-like. I want to be as close to Jesus as possible. And I know while I'm in this body, I could never get there. But every day I can try to get better and better and better. So long as I remember, I'm not God. I don't make the rules. I love Jesus, so I'll obey what he says. And I can only obey what he says if I know what he says. And the only way you know what he says is by reading this book. And in those parts where you have to swallow hard, it doesn't mean don't love people that don't abide by it. Of course love the people that don't abide by it. Pray for them. Talk to them. Just do what Jesus told his disciples. Just don't do what they do. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Amen. I'm done. Amen. Congratulations.